final study session. We will be covering material from weeks 1 through week 4. We will not be doing week 5 because that is non-tested material. Let us begin with week 1. What are the different cognitive biases and heuristics we covered? So before we continue, I'm going to just list them out and then I'll define them. For cognitive biases, we have the Dunning-Kruger effect, motivated reasoning, confirmation bias, leftmost digit bias, <clears throat> handedness bias, framing bias, gambler's fallacy, in-group bias, projection bias, consensus bias, and hindsight bias. As for what are our heuristics, we have availability heuristics of representative heuristic. From there we have anchoring heuristic. And now that we've listed them all off, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Let's explain what they are. So the Dunning-Kruger effect. In 1999, psychologists David Dunning and Justin Kruger, Justin Kruger published a paper called Unskilled and Unaware of It, how, difference, how difficulties in recognizing one's own incompetence led to inflated self-assessments. In a sense, people believe that they are above average. Pretty simple. People don't like to believe they're inferior, and that's fine. In addition, when people are incompetent in strategies that they need to do to adopt or success, achieve satisfaction in other forms, they suffer a burden because not only do they reach the conclusion that they are actually better than they really are, but they rob themselves of the ability to figure out what is wrong with them so that they may ultimately make a better choice. In that way, it can be seen as a very sad effect. Up next, motivated reasoning. Motivated reasoning, on the other hand, is much simpler. That is the unconscious tendency of individuals to fit their reasoning to conclusions that suit some end or goal they have. So, in a sense, it's predicated on something called cognitive dissonance. This was pioneered by Leon Festinger in 1957. Cognitive dissonance theory claims that 1. Being presented with conflicting pieces of information causes us psychological suffering and 2. In response to said suffering We avoid it, or more accurately, to avoid it, we change our beliefs to make the evidence professing, uh, that demonstrates a, a conflicting information to make it less conflicting. 
Hmm. In a sense, if my end goal is to tell you that the sky is red, and I believe full-heartedly the sky is red, but then you tell me the sky is blue, and you explain that it has to do with the fact that you know, the atmosphere makes it blue. What would end up happening is I'm attached to the belief that the sky is red. So in my mind, I presented, I am presented with the information. And let's just say that one of my preconceived notions that you're not lying to me, just to make it more explicit. In a way to make it seem that you're not lying to me, while I still hold on to believe that the sky is red, even though it's not, it's actually blue, I could say, I believe that you think the sky is blue because what I see is red, you see is blue, or some other way to contradict the evidence without completely changing it. And this is done so that they can reduce suffering in their mind. Of course, we have confirmation bias as well. And confirmation bias is the tendency to seek out, notice, accept, remember, or interpret information as support for previously held beliefs. In a sense, we only care about information that helps our side slash mindset. <clears throat> okay. And we even distort, forget, or ignore information that contradicts us. So if we take it back to motivated reasoning, for example, in the example, let's say that you told me the sky is blue and I'm not and I'm predisposed to saying that you're not lying to me and that I believe the sky is red, but you're telling me the sky is blue, then instead of coming up with my little motivated reasoning to explain why said evidence does not hold up, I'll simply just ignore it, okay? I'll say, you never told me that. What are you talking about? You're lying. And I'll only bring up bogus articles that say, hey, the sky is red, look it up. See, this is why these biases can be very dangerous in thinking. They make it more difficult to think critically under what the professor has espoused to be critical thinking. Now, this is not to say that confirmation bias and it's not to say that confirmation bias nor motivated reasoning are the same thing. In fact, they're quite different. Confirmation bias is not about reasoning, it's about behavior. Behavior to seek out notice accept, reject, remember, or forget things. This is all in the name of creating salience of ideas rather than justifying them. Whereas motivated reasoning has to do only with the reasoning process in our mind. It is about the reasoning process. In a sense, this involves us being a lot more conscious about what we're doing. If we have confirmation bias, that's typically unconscious. We don't really notice it unless we're, I don't know, unless we're a news article or something, in which case they definitely notice it, but they don't care. And even then that would still fall under, that would still fall under motivated reasoning and not confirmation bias, but they'll try to sell it off like it's confirmation bias just because they can. What confirmation bias does is it gives people the illusion that he or she whom follows does so with evidence. And this illusion is quite confident, okay? This isn't just me saying, I believe X. No. This is a lot deeper than that. This is, I only care about that which supports X given X is my belief. Okay, pretty strong, okay? This is a pretty strong section. Unlike the, this is, this would be confirmation bias. Motivated reasoning is just, I'm only, I'm going to misconstrue everything 
to make sure that my side is right regardless of what is presented, whereas motivate confirmation bias is we're just out here saying, nah, we are doing this because I say so. Left mode digit bias is much simpler. In a sense, if we look at a number, say $19, okay? $19. Mm, let's make it 190 okay, $1,995, okay? Most people, even though, even though, 1,995 is close to 2,000 by 5 and close to 1,000 by 995, for whatever reason, people will assume that it's closer to the 1. It's closer to 1,000. And the reason that happens is because people aren't thinking, okay? These kinds of tricks have been used in businesses for for eons. That's why things are nineteen ninety nine instead of twenty dollars, because that works on people who don't think. In a sense, leftmost digit bias is that people tend to assess longer numbers based on the leftmost number, and nothing else. Handedness bias has to do with your hands. So if you're right-handed, like the majority of the population. When we're presented with two choices, presented with two choices, specifically that are equivalent, we choose, or there is, we tend to choose the choice that corresponds to our dominant hand. Simple enough. Framing bias is the tendency for people to see choices that are presented differently, but in all essence the same as either preferable or unpreferable depending on how it is told to you. If I say that you have a surgery with a 90% survival rate, or that there is a surgery with a 10% death rate, these are, in a sense, the same statement. If a surgery is out of 100% because we're not bringing, we're not going to bring math that goes beyond the realm of high school into this, then we know that this is a surgery that is 9 out of 10 to live and 1 out of 10 to die. And we know that this is a surgery with 1 out of 10 to die, meaning that it is 9 out of 10 to live. Now hold on. These are, like I said here, they're the same statement. However, the average person who is not privy to this stuff, after all, you are not immune to propaganda and you never will be, this sounds better. Why? Because people who aren't privy to information tend to just stop thinking. It's a human trick, okay? Uh, human tricks are very useful, okay? Your brain will make these tricks up to make it easier to flow through life. But when you really think about what's going on, you realize that you're being duped, okay? Gambler's fallacy. So this is the belief that past events influence future events when there is no causal connection between them. For example, let's say I flip a coin. What is that? One in two chance of right of heads. Let's say that I, I don't know, decide to, you know what? Let's do roll a die. This makes it easier to explain. Roll a die which is a 1 out of 6. And let's say I, uh, for a 6, okay? Let's say that I roll a die 1, and I get a 2, and then I roll a die and I get a 3, and then I roll again and I get a 5, and then a 4, and then a 1. Or it could be any combination of numbers. Gambler's fallacy would dictate, okay, it's due for a 6. 
And that's wrong. Because it could also be the case that I roll a 1, a 1, a 1, a 1, a 1, and a 1, or a 6. And the, same t and the reason I can do that is because the past rolls have no effect on the current roll of die. This is why people who gamble without a strategy, or people who just like to bet on the odds without thinking through, tend to become poor. Especially when under high pressure and in high stakes. Believe it or not, there are people who specialize in these human tricks that take advantage of people who do this. And now we have in-group bias. In a sense, we've, we've favor members of our own groups instead of others. For example, if a mother has to decide between her son or a stranger's kid to save from a boat that's going to crash and there's only one more space there's only one more space left on the lifeboat and both of these kids are five no even worse we're gonna say that the mother's son is 15 and that the random kid is five the mother is gonna pick the 15 year old why because the person of her group now that's obviously for the you know uh, adaption okay like super survival tactics get your genes to spread but if you really think about it, it the optimal for the look okay, the optimal decision for the unbiased party is to take the younger one but in this instance we have an example wherein we now have a biased party a member of a family therefore in group bias proves that they favored the sun even though objectively assuming neither of them have any health effects none of them are in bad position they're both going to succeed depending on who you save that is a really good example of anger bias and then of course we have projection bias projection bias is we assume people think like we do we think people think like we do and then we have consensus bias be very careful about people who have consensus bias, okay? They assume that your opinions are the majority. So people whom, no, who assume that the way they th think and their opinions are the norm. And sometimes you're right, okay? If we have a bunch of, I don't know, elementary school teachers teaching grades three to five, they probably think that their method of how they get the ch the children to do X, Y, Z for them or how they can, or how they grade is done the same way. No, in fact, the, the way teachers teach a class is very different from each teacher, but they have some idea of what each teacher does, assuming they're not, you know, deadbeats or just bad people. Because we're trying to assume the best in people. Because if you can't assume the best in people, then you can't properly think through things. You'll only get an answer that it could approximate the truth, but we don't know if it's the truth without some confirmation. And finally, we have hindsight bias. People assume that past events were inevitable. <clears throat> in a sense... <clears throat> Let's say that I roll a die and it lands on a three. However, you know, let's draw it out. I roll a die and it lands on three. Why? Because I said so. Mm, no real reason other than that. So this is three. This is going to be two. This will be five. This is one and this is six. I would think, okay, no matter how I roll this die, I was always going to get a three. False. I could take the next option and just not roll the die. Just just walk away. Okay? Just just leave. And not even roll the die at all. And that's a valid outcome, okay? That's something I could do if I really felt like it. There's nothing forcing me to have actually rolled the die in the first place. 
Therefore, that event was definitely enough is was definitely preventable. However, at the time of thinking, when I think back, hindsight bias, I could be believed, I could be made to believe by either myself or someone trying to convince me that that event would have happened no matter what happened. And then, of course, we have cognitive heuristics. Now that we've finished our little biases, let's do heuristics. Some more fun stuff. So what's availability heuristics? Availability heuristics is that we can assume that if we can easily call an example something in mind, it must be common or important. <clears throat> For an example, we can call we can call upon, and this is going to be a rather depressing subject, the number of crimes committed at a school. Uh, use your imagination. Why? Because they're in the news. We recall them. But if you want to talk about say something that is more common, say crime committed in the streets or the hood, that is more common than crimes committed at school. It's just that we remember the crimes committed at the schools much more because the news will report on it and it'll be more sensationalized, so we think it's more common. Because the truth is, a crime at a school is much sadder than, oh, like X person perished on street in some bum city LA. For example, that sounds cold, and <laughs> but that's what it is, okay? Just because we can remember something more easily does not make it more common. The next one we have is representative heuristic. So we assume that if someone or something has a feature of a typical category, they belong to that category. For example, let's say that a person, that there's a person out here who, I don't know, decides to drive motorcycles. I Excuse my drawing, I don't, I don't really draw a lot. Okay, they decide that they draw motorcycles because they're cool and that they're going at 100 mph or something. And they get into accidents on the road. We would assume that this is just one of those guys who belong to the group of people who are constantly speeding on the freeway. Those of you who drive the freeway to Riverside, I think you've all encountered at least one of these guys. However, while it's true that we might think this is just some 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 jag who is out here speeding, that's not actually true. We could also say this guy could be a racer, or even yet, this could be his first time riding a motorcycle and he got out of control. We don't know. He could even be a professional racer, you know, work racing for the tracks, which is technically a road because it's still made of the same material. Or another case, if we assume that a p group of people mm, from the town of Moak, because they all carry bracelets on them, or some famous jewel on them because they're all rich, have a lot of these jewels on them. If we assume that somebody, who we don't know, has one of those jewels, we can't just assume that they're from Moak simply because they have one of those jewels. It could, it's also possible that, that person could just have the jewel, because either they took it, they bought one from a different city, or X, Y, Z, there's an unbelievable number of possibilities that could occur. Now, how do we counter biases and heuristics? Because these all seem, you know, pretty strong. Oh, I almost forgot. We have anchoring heuristics. In a sense, before making a decision, people will rely on the first piece of information before, no, people will rely on the first piece of information and they will treat it as though that piece of information has an effect on the rest of the information they have, even if, no, regardless of how relevant that piece of information is. So, if I tell you if I tell you, some humans live forever, forever 
And that's your first introduction to the human lifespan. And then everyone's talking about X died here, Y died there, and Z died, blah, 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 blah. You would perceive this evidence and think, okay, so these just are not some humans, or that these humans that live forever have some way to avoid being these humans. But in reality, this information is fact. You just have some, there's just this weird brain shortcut that exists in the mind that tries to treat the first piece of information as a fact, whether or not it is true. Because we know that humans don't live forever. Okay? However, if we tell this to someone who doesn't know that, and then they see instances of humans living and dying, they're going to try to use this to color their perspective on this, even though it has no bearing on it, as it's a given falsehood. As for what I was saying earlier, the way we counter these heuristics is by being aware of them, okay? As long as you're aware of the heuristics, you're aware of the cognitive biases and know how to counter them because in your mind you've practiced doing so, you can be better at countering them. However, one caveat I would like to point out is that biases and heuristics exist for a reason. They're a result of adapting to our environment. That's not to say that having these heuristics and biases and not doing anything about it makes you stupid. That's a false claim. What it is telling you is that you're a person. My, cl my claim earlier of you're not immune to propaganda and you never will be will always be true because we're people, but at the same time, you can mitigate it, especially if you know what's going on. If you don't know what's going on, then it will affect you, unless you are one of the most logical and critical thinking individuals on the earth. So that's it for the heuristics and the biases. We have the Dunning-Kruger effect, motivated reasoning. Confirmation bias, leftmost digit bias, handedness bias, framing bias, gambler's fallacy, in-group bias, projection bias, consensus bias, hindsight bias, con cognitive heuristics include availability heuristic, representative heuristic, anchoring heuristic, and those are the three. Simple enough. Let's move on to structured paraphrase. Specifically, how do we do them and what codes do we use? Well, to do so, we need to understand something called cause and effect. You know, that was a terrible everything for this word. I can't point to any one letter being bad. Effect. Better, but not good. We need to understand how and why. So we need to have an, an example of explanatory questions. For example, how do I use the phone's recorder function? Why did you get here late? Why did you pick this jacket instead of the other one? All of these are questions are examples of explanatory question. This does not mean that something counts as an explanation only if it explicitly answers a question anyone has specifically asked you. For example, you can figure out if any X can count as an explanation by seeing if you can create a how or why question to which the x sounds to which the x seems to be an answer some examples were the dinosaurs went extinct because of a meteor which 
is true. And the other one would be the light in the sky last night was a blimp. And of course, we have you can get to the grocery store by taking your next right, then a left in two blocks. So different kinds of explanations can take different forms and concern different subject matter. There are mathematical explanations, the ones that if you took high school proofs, you'll know them, or at the very least you'll loathe them, depending on how studious you were back then. Scientific explanations, you honor students should know about these. Historical explanations mean that if you know about the past, you can probably explain things. Uh, metaphysical explanations, and so on and so forth. And any successful causal explanations will contain at least one cause and one effect. Any causal explanations, some example of causal explanations include the tree falling on the power line caused the blackout, or low confidence in the tech industry caused several stocks to decline, or the plane crashed because of its fuel tank, specifically the fact it exploded, and of course the Dodgers lost because their best player was injured which was due to a car accident. And now we must know what is an inference before we can continue. An inference is a process of deriving a conclusion from some evidence. Remember, we will be focusing on arguments which are our most explicit way to communicate inferences. An argument is an explicit inference with the aim of persuading someone of something. Every argument will involve one conclusion, one main conclusion, and one or more premises, which can be seen as piece of evidence. There is overlap between inference and explanation, and specifically, causal explanations are the cause and effect, but sometimes we want to know about cause and effects to which we don't have direct access. Thus, there are hybrid activities that combine inference and explanation. Some easy cases. First, let's go to two easy cases. Which include predictions and inference to the best explanation. Predictions are, we want to know the future effects of some present events, but since they are in the future, we do not have direct access to them. Thus, there are hybrid... Oops but do not have direct access to them, period. And the other one, inference the best explanation, is this. We want to know the cause of something. We want to know the cause of something, but we weren't around to witness, so we do not have direct access to it. And I always recommend having a piece of pen and paper to write this down with me as it helps with studying. Now let's look at the more difficult case, which is the hybrid. So inference slash explanation hybrids. And in this case, we have the causal mechanisms. We know that A leads to C somehow, but we don't know what 
happens in between A and C. In other words, we are looking for step B. But we do not have direct access to it, as this requires an inference about the way in which A leads to C. You see this a lot in science, okay? People want to know why there is a correlation between two things, say A and C, and do an experiment in order to conclude that the reason for the correlation is that A can lead to B, which can lead to C. This is starting to set things up. Now that we understand this, or at the very least, we know that this has to be true, otherwise, what are we doing? We can start solving for structured paraphrases. Now let's look at the structure. Okay, structure. Now let's get the steps. Step one is to separate the different claims being made. A claim makes one point, but a claim is not the same thing as a sentence, as we can see from our example. Multiple sentences can make the same point, and one sentence can contain multiple points. To know how many claims there are in a piece of text, we need to go through it sentence by sentence and see how much of what is claimed is logically independent of everything else being claimed. Logical independence just means that one point can be true or false independent of other things in the text being true or false. For example, Let's look at a structure. We have my gas tank is almost empty, so I should go get some gas. This contains two claims. And those claims are that my gas tank is almost empty and that I should get some gas. Now step two requires us to have them separated. In a sense, we format it like this somewhat. And then from here, we have to explain one of the codes. And the four codes are evidence, conclusion, cause, and effect. We don't need to label the primary one because that's given. So in this case, we can see that we are dealing with an inference. The first claim is evidence, and the so that we removed means in this case that the second claim is a conclusion. So we label it as follows. My gas tank is almost empty. Conclusion, I should go get gas, or some gas, as it is said here. Simple, this is how you do a structured paraphrase. So to review, just to review, there are the structured phrases in code. If step one, well, let's get the steps first. Step one, the main claims. Let's use a different one. Rosa aced her music performance. She must have practiced a lot. Step two is arrange the claims, which would be as follows. Rosa aced her music performance. She must have studied a lot. And then from here, we can see that it's a conclusion. Okay, we're concluding that she studied a lot. That's how she aced her musical performance. However, notice how I said that is how she did it. That would mean that something caused it. And in this case, it's not just a conclusion. It's a cause. And that is how you would do a structured paraphrase for a hybrid. But at the same time, that one was kind of easy. Let's do a harder one, because we're going to be taking the final exam, okay? If you don't know how to do the hard ones, 
then when he gives you one of the hard ones, you're just doomed, okay? There was a blackout this morning. It was caused by an explosion at the power plant, which was due to an employee falling asleep on the job. Technicians took three hours to restore power, which led to some people being late to work. Step one, we need to separate the, co the causes based on their logical independence. Please note that I said C-L-A-U-S-E-S -E -S and not C-A-U-S-E-S, -E clauses. Said clauses are, there was a blackout this morning. It, it was caused by an explosion at the power plant, which was due to an employee falling asleep on the job and technicians took three hours to restore power, which led to some people being late to work. And now we need to do step two. Step two once more is to arrange the claims to show the structure and delete the connecting terms along with fluff or filler. And that would look like this. There was a blackout this morning. Then we have explosion at the power plant. And from here we indent and get an employee falling asleep on the job. And of course we also have the next claim, which is technicians took three hours to restore power. And this would lead to another one that says some people were late to work. And now that we're here, we have to label it with the four codes. The first one is pretty simple, the cause. Nothing too difficult yet. The second one is also a cause. The explosion of the power plant was the cause of a blackout in the morning. The cause of the explosion of the power plant was an employee falling asleep on the job. Technicians took three hours to restore power. Which is... Some people were late to work is an effect. So this is of the technicians taking three hours to restore power. Although, more accurately, says technicians took three hours to restore power is the first statement, and then the effect of said statement is that some people were late. To conclude, the four codes are cause, effect, conclusions, and evidence. These need to be explained in inference to best explanation, or IBE. Simple enough. And now we have, what are the three main cases in which a hybrid coding is necessary for a structured paraphrase? Well, once we get to hybrid coding, we need three cases. And we already mentioned them earlier, believe it or not. So case one is prediction which is we want to know the future effects of some present event, but since they are in the future, we do not have direct access to them. The next one is inference to the best explanation, 
or IBE, which is we want to know the cause of something, but we weren't around to witness, so we don't have direct access to it. And of course we have the last one being causal mechanisms. We know that A leads to C somehow. But we don't know what happens in between A and C. In other words, we are looking for step B, but we do not have direct access to it. This is because it requires an inference about the way in which A leads to C. And that, to me, seems simple enough. That is everything for week one that you need to know. If you have any questions, just put it in the comments or something, or just message me yourselves. So what I'm going to do is begin week two right now. But first, first, if you haven't done something already, get a water, get a pen and paper out. You gotta study this with us. I'd also like to point out that the professor, if you're taking the class at the moment, or if you're just watching this in the future for the sake of having a good time, has given out a sheet sheet, which is the only thing I'm looking at other than my screen and the questions on the study guide. And so let's do this. So what are the parts of an argument? Week two. What are the parts of an argument? Well, we know that an argument is a declarative sentence. Well, this is a part of the argument. Sentence is a sentence that is either true or false. So this is what a declarative sentence is, not, not an argument. Some examples include the following. You are watching a YouTube video. Previous experience tells me that if you don't eat in the next few hours, I am going to become grumpy at you for not eating, or that if I don't eat, let's say, let's make this easier, that if I don't eat in the next few hours, I'm going to become grumpy, lightheaded, or delirious. And I gotta tell you guys, being delirious is not a state you ever want to be in. It sucks. And another one is that there are an even number of stars. That could be true. It could also be false. We don't know unless we manually count these things. And there are there are an obscene amount that we can observe. But imagine how many we can't. It's a bit deep to guess at the end of the day. Are there an even or not number of stars? Completely 50-50, we do not know. Because it's either yes or no. Well, it's actually a true-false question. That's a 50% chance question. You just gotta think about it. Now let's get some examples of a non-declarative sentence. Non-declarative sentences include something along the lines of Go shut the door! Yeah! You know, I'm, I'm just imagining someone's mother uh, saying to a young kid here, and the kid has to shut the door that is way too big because it's actually open completely. Why did I draw that? <laughs> okay, and the other one is boo! Insert sports team name here. Okay, those are some examples of non-declarative sentences. Now that we know that much, 
let us continue. I would also like to point out that an argument is a set of declarative sentences where one of the sentences, the conclusion, is meant to be supported by the other sentences called premises. I misspelled that premises. Okay, premises. Arguments, by the way, do not just assert a claim. They attempt to establish a claim. So what are the two tests that an argument can pass? The two tests that an argument can pass are validity and soundness. These can be summarized as evaluations, but that's both of them. In a sense, validity and soundness are your two tests. What general criteria make an argument good? As I said before, to have a good argument, your argument must, or at the very least for the sake of being more specific, instead of using must, let's just say that the two general criteria are that your argument has to be a set of declarative sentences, where one of the sentences is the conclusion, and it is meant to be supported by other sentences, the premises, and this argument needs to try to establish a claim rather than just assert it. And now that we know that, let's do some schematization. This will be fun. Schematizing arguments. Once you know that a passage contains an argument, differentiate the parts of the argument. Arguments have two parts, as I've already said it. The premises and the conclusion. Example of an argument would go as follows. All humans are mortal. George Bush is human. So, George Bush is mortal. I'm not going to use the exact one the professor used because otherwise that's straight up plagiarism. I'm just changing the words a little bit. That way it's called parody, don't you know? <laughs> Don't do that on your exam, by the way. Don't cheat. Don't even try to parry someone else. Okay, go in it with your own work. This is just for the sake of having a good laugh. So from there, we have to take our three claims, our three info bits. Those are that all humans are mortal. George Bush is mortal. And that George Bush is human. My apologies. George Bush is human, and George Bush is mortal. That makes things easier to do. To schematize it, we have to take these three info bits and put them like follows. P1, which stands for premise 1, although admittedly it can be any leather, says that all humans are mortal. Premise 2 states that George Bush is mortal. M human. George Bush is human. Therefore, awesome, therefore, barra, George Bush is human. Good. Wow, I messed that up. Cut. Three. Hold on. Three, two, one, action. To explain how to schematize these, we need to take these info bits and put them as follows. P1 is all humans are mortal. P2 
is George Bush is human. So to conclude it, we write a little line underneath it and say, conclusion, which is going to be stood in for C, is that George Bush is mortal. We need to establish a George Bush. So all humans are mortal. George Bush is humans. Therefore, George Bush is mortal. To summarize it, George Bush is A. Human is B. If A, then B. Given A. Uh, if B, then C. If A, then C. A causes C. George Bush is mortal. Or in this case, not causes, but it leads to it. And you'll notice that in this instance, we removed collector slash indicator words such as so as they are not a part of this oftentimes passages will contain multiple premises in a single sentence when schematizing these sentences make sure that every premise gets its own line so let's look at this one everyone who is happy is rich and getting a college degree will help me be happy. So, getting a college degree oh, not help me be happy, will help me get rich. Let me fix that. Will help me get rich. So, Getting a college degree will make help me be happy. Okay. We remember, in a case like this, we do not care if our premises are true or false. We're just schematizing them. P1 is everyone who is happy is rich. And premise two is that getting a college degree will help me be happy. Once we have our two premises written out, we have to write the conclusion, which states getting a college degree will make me happy. And I messed this up again. See, this is why you have to check your work after writing it down. That will help me be happy, will help me get rich. There we go. So everyone who's happy is rich. Getting a college degree will help me get rich. So college degree is A, getting rich is B, and everyone who is happy is C. A will lead to C. That is how you schematize things in these form of arguments. What is the principle of charity? The principle of charity is to treat people as intelligent. By doing so, you will do a better job at evaluating said person's argument. Be fair to that individual. Do not assume the individual is of malintent. Otherwise, you're going to be arguing in poor faith, and we will not lead to anything productive. It'll just lead to two people yelling at each other. Like politicians. But at least they get paid for that. Now we need to know. What are implicit premises and conclusions? Let's check them out. I also would like to point out that if you are watching this video, make sure you watch it at times two speed because my method of speech is rather slow for some people. And also I highly recommend doing it so to save yourself some time and you can look at the video more often. I don't care about my watch time, I, this is a hobby. If we have the following text, George Bush is mortal. After all, he is human. We would schematize it like this. George Bush is human. Close line. Conclusion. George Bush is mortal. But wait just a second, something about that it seems wrong. And you're obvious to point that out. I pressed insert on accident, okay. Because there's an implicit, which I'm going to dig 
to which I'm going to designate by putting an asterisk there. Premise that says all humans are mortal. That is just something that we know as a fact. This is our implicit premise. Now that we know this, we can move on to a harder one. Not too much harder. Just just a little bit, because we're still in week two and not week three and four. Week week two is probably the hardest week, by the way. If you can do if you can do week two, week three and four are going to be a piece of cake. We know that violence only breeds more violence. Assuming this is so, we should teach kids how to solve their problems verbally rather than physically, unless we want to live in a violent society. So, we should teach kids how to solve their problems verbally rather than physically. It's just so obvious. First, let's remove some fluff from the argument and we would say it like this. Violence only breeds more violence. Assuming that this is so. Okay, so if violence breeds more violence, then we should teach kids how to solve their problems verbally rather than physically. Unless we want to live in a violent society, meaning we do not want to live in a violent society, we should teach kids how to solve their problems verbally rather than physically. So how do we schematize this? Violence only breeds more violence. Pre premise two is assuming violence can only violence only breeds more violence. We should teach kids how to solve their problems verbally rather than physically. Okay? Unless we want to live in a violent society. Conclusion here would be as follows. We should teach kids how to solve their problems verbally rather than physically. And while that does work, let's rephrase it to make the argument easier, just a little bit easier to follow, because I trust you all to be able to follow this. But for the sake of following the rules of rephrasing, we'll get this. Violence only causes more violence. We should teach kids how to solve their problems verbally rather than physically, and violence only causes. Because breed is used metaphorically, okay? We mean causes violence, not breeds violence. Otherwise, we have an issue. And as I said before, the point of rephrasing is just to make it easier to follow the argument. Now let's add the implicit premises, okay? And we kind of, and I kind of alluded to it earlier. Pause the video and try to figure out what premise three is. If you know it, if you don't know it, well, if you do know it, then I'm just gonna do this. We know that this is the implicit premise. So if you do know it, pause the video, write it down. If you don't know it, try to do the same thing. And if you just refuse, three, two, one, I'll give it to you right now. We do not want to live in a violent society. And I said that because earlier I was pointing out how in the text it says unless we want to live in a violent society, which we don't. There you go. Now let's look at some implicit conclusions. Let's use the same tricks to find them. Let's, let's look at it. George Bush is human. Well, he's human, and all humans 
are mortal. That's our argument, per se. But there seems to be a conclusion missing. So let's do this correctly. P1 is George Bush is human. And P2 is that all humans are mortal. And now we have to find the implicit conclusion. And that would be that George Bush is mortal. Good. And that is our implicit conclusion. In a sense, implicit premises and conclusion are just unstated premises or unstated conclusions that are there if you apply the principle of charity that they'll solve for them. Or if you happen to have the examples in front of you, you can do that as well, but realistically you'd be applying principle of charity here. What are sub-arguments? Okay, what is a sub- Well, a sub-argument is an argument that <clears throat> contains an inductive sub-argument if the thinker reasons from one sample to another. Now that is just the very technical dictionary definition. Let's do an example to really understand this, because de definitions are good. We need to know definitions. We can't be changing definitions all willy-nilly, although Merriam-Webster would like to think otherwise. So let's answer this. Minimum wage laws create a barrier to getting a job that the privileged are better able to overcome than the underprivileged. When jobs are scarce, then immigrant workers with few skills or education, and those with limited English proficiency, are going to have a harder time convincing employers that their labor is worth $15 an hour than their better skilled native English-speaking competitors. As Thomas Leonard has recently shown, employing such marginalized groups was regarded as part of the point of minimum wage laws by the 20th century. Progressives who saw the minimum wage as a useful tool for keeping immigrants, blacks, and women out of the labor market. But the effect hasn't changed in the last hundred years. Even if our moral evaluation of it has. Now let me give this to you straight. I was never for the minimum wage. Okay. To hell with the unions. But let's just solve this one. P1. Well, to hell with unions for jobs that are not dangerous. Okay, if you have a dangerous job, like you're working in contracting or something, or construction or something else, that's super dangerous, then yeah, unions all the way. Factory jobs, go ahead. But if you're working as a teacher, you don't need a teacher's union. That's just a waste of money. P1. The $15 an hour minimum wage loss creates a barrier to getting a job that the privileged are a are better able to overcome than the underprivileged as opposed and premise two would be any law that creates a barrier to getting a job that the privileged are better able to overcome than the underprivileged should be repealed. Now, that's not stated anywhere in the text that I just read, so this is an implicit premise. And what is our conclusion as opposed as given in the text? And that is C, the $15 an hour minimum wage law should be repealed. And that's our implicit conclusion. Uh, okay. Why is this here? Weird. Very weird. Not really sure what caused that, but let's get back to work. Okay. I'm not sure why I got that link, but
but let's continue. Dollar an hour minimum wage law should be repealed. That's an implicit premise, implicit conclusion. So I'm going to write another asterisk there. Awesome. So now we have the conclusion. Let's start with our sub argument. So SP1, when jobs are scarce, the, the underprivileged share have a harder time convincing their employers that their labor is worth $15 an hour. Simple enough. And SC1 is equal to P1. Fair enough. Now, mind you, the same, the same section can have other subprivileges as well. Let's look at this. SP2, so sub-premise number two, says that Thomas Leonard has claimed that part of the point of minimum wage laws originally was to create a barrier for the underprivileged. And then from here, we have SP3. If that was, oh, this is considered an implicit sub-premise, by the way. If that was part of the point of minimum wage laws originally, then the $15 an hour minimum wage minimum wage law creates a barrier for the underprivileged fair enough and now that you know that we can get our sub conclusion funnily enough in this instance Subconclusion one is equal to premise one. But we're not done. Oh no, we can keep going. Sub sub premise one is that Thomas Leonard has claimed that part of the point of minimum wage laws originally was to create a barrier for the underprivileged. And sub sub premise two is that Thomas Leonard is a reliable, oh, by the way, this is an implicit as it's not stated in the text. Thomas Leonard is a reliable source. And now that we have this, sub sub conclusion one is equal to sub premise two. And that is how you do a sub argument. That is how you schematize in using implicit premises sub arguments and sub sub arguments i don't think he's going to ask us one that is this over the top difficult on the exam but if he does you know how to do it now you just got to practice it you have practice examples and if you don't then look for them on the internet you can probably find some and just practice those now i have week to review really quickly an argument is a set of declarative sentences, one of which the conclusion is meant to be supported by the other's premises. Some arguments contain arg some passages contain arguments, others don't. Look for conclusion indicator words. Try to insert conclusion indicator words. Not every part of the passage is a part of the argument. Passages often contain filler. 
Some arguments are unclear. Rephrase premises and conclusions. Add implicit premises and conclusions. Some passages contain multiple arguments, and by that I mean that some passages contain sub-arguments for premises, and some passages contain multiple arguments for the same conclusion. And when schematizing someone else's argument, always follow the principle of charity. Put the argument in such a way that the author will be happy with it. In a sense, don't try to villainize the author. Try to make his point as clear as possible. And when giving your own arguments, make sure that you're as clear as possible. You don't want the burden of having an unclear argument. Just a quick addendum, because the teacher's assistant gave me a little bit more information. Regarding validity, because I said one of the tests, the two tests for an argument are validity and soundness. However, I did not tell say what those were, validity and soundness. And as I said, I did not give an explanation of what they were. So validity are, well, the requirements for validity are the conclusion must follow from the premise. And for soundness, the premises are valid. That's the criteria. If the premises are valid, then the argument has soundness. Other than that, I want to thank you all for watching, and I wish you all the best of luck on your exams. Have a nice summer. I'm back. Just did some gardening work. Let's continue. So we'll end it off on week two review. An argument is a set of declarative sentences, one of which the conclusion is meant to be supported by the other premises. Some passages contain arguments, others don't. Look for conclusion indicator words. Try to insert conclusion indicator words. Not every part of the passage is a part of the argument. The passages often contain filler. Some arguments are unclear, and by that I mean we need to rephrase premises and conclusions and add implicit premises and conclusions to make it clearer. Some passages contain multiple arguments. By that, I mean some passages contain multiple sub-arguments for premises, and some passages contain arguments for the same conclusion. When schematizing someone else's argument, always follow the principle of charity, and by that, I mean put the arguments in a way that the author will be happy with, and, given, and when giving your own arguments, make sure to be clear. Let us continue with week three. What are deductive, validity, and soundness, okay? Uh, what are deductive? validity and soundness let's check Ooh, this is a week three material so we're halfway through it so validity and soundness is a deductive argument it is said to be valid if and only if it takes a form that makes it impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion nevertheless to be false otherwise a deductive argument is said to be invalid to make it clearer what that means, I'm going to copy and paste the table that I wrote onto the notepad here. So in an invalid argument, you put in a true premise and you get out either a true or false conclusion. You put in a true premise, you get either a true or false conclusion. A valid argument, however, if you put in a false premise, you get either a true or false conclusion. And if you put in true premises and only true premises, you can only get a true conclusion. If you put in only true premises and get a false conclusion, then it's an invalid argument. We can tell that an argument is seductive if it tries to validly go from premise to conclusion. And validity is an argument where conclusion follows from the premises. What are the methods for telling if an argument is deductively valid or not? To do so, there are two tests that can be performed. Those are the possibility test, which is, can you think of a scenario where in all the premises are true, but the conclusion is false? And B, the well-known counter example. This one's a bit difficult to just explain, so I'm gonna show you it. Let's say I'm gonna give you two premises that are, that seem true, so let's put it this way. Uh, bacon is a. Okay, how's this? If Bacon wrote. Uh, Stephen King's 
it, then he, then Bacon, is a great rider. That will be premise one. Okay. Seems simple enough. At least I think so. And then premise two will be P2 is Bacon is a great writer. And I'm even going to capitalize the great just to, ins just to insinuate how great he is. Therefore, the conclusion could be Bacon wrote Stephen King's It. How we could do a well-known counterexample would be Let's look at one that obviously is false. I mean, this is obviously false, but if you didn't know who Bacon is, and you don't know who Stephen King is, and you don't know what it is, then this is going to be a bit difficult to do. But the one given to us, another example is, this is an if, these would be an P1, an if A, then B, P2, B, therefore, Therefore, A, which, by the way, is denying the antecedent, so I don't think this actually works. But in a sense, the way we could do this is P1, if there is fire in the, if there is fire, then there is air. P2, there is air, therefore, there is fire. We all know that there can be air in a building wherein fire does not exist as if you're watching this and are not currently in an accident, that's probably the case. Assuming no one's cooking, of course. And this is an obvious counterexample that proves that the above argument is not true. And it also proves that I'm not a great writer. For the time being, I'll get better, I promise. And next, we're going to be talking about all the famous forms. You have these on your cheat sheet, but it never hurts to write them, okay? What are the famous forms? The famous forms in the famous form method. Let's see, we have modus ponens. I cannot spell, apparently. And that is the following. P1, if A, then B. Premise, P2, A, premise, step, C, B, P1, comma, P2, comma, and P. That's modus ponens. In a sense, if A, then B. A is given, therefore B. Up next, we have hypothetical syllogism, or syllogism, depending on how you spell it. And we have P1, which would be if A, then B, which is premise. P2, the if B, then C, premise, therefore, if A, then C, P1, P2, HS. And this is looking a lot like structured paraphrasing, doesn't it? I think so. Hypothetical syllogism. The next of the famous form methods is the disjunctive syllogism, which is P1, if A, then B, premise, my apologies, it is either A or B, that's the premise. P2 is, now the reason I write premise here is because technically you can put whatever you want here as long as you're consistent. So I write premise out 
for the sake of being very clear that it's a premise. Either A or B, not A, premise. Therefore, B, which is P1, P2, and C, because you get it from these two. Oh, a DS. There we go. Up next, we have modus tollens, which is P1, if A, then B, P2 would be not B, okay, this is a premise, this is a premise, and then we put a line underneath to separate it, our conclusion would be not A, because of P1, P2, and this would be MT. The next famous form is the constructive dilemma. Dilemma, perfect. Wherein we have P1 being either A or B, which is our premise. P2 will be if A, then C, which is a premise. P3 will be if B, then D, premise. And then finally, we have our conclusion for this one. Also, this is to be a 3, not a 2. Get our line, 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 line. Conclusion being either C or D. And it'll be P1, P2, and P3, comma, CD. And then finally, we have the contrapositive, or as I like to call this, the Jeffrey Epstein proof. P1 will be if A, then B, which is a premise. And we only have one. C would be, if not B, then not A, which is uh, P1, comma, cheese pizza. How can we use the famous four methods to derive slash establish the validity of a conclusion? And the answer is, if you can use the famous forms, then you can derive an argument. And if you get the conclusion, the argument is valid. I was going to do a different one, one that's a bit simpler, but I figured we gotta show off, right? Absolutely, we gotta show off. Therefore, I'm going to get effectively the hardest one in the class, because if you can solve this one, then you can solve the rest of them, because this one uses every single trick. This one does more than all the homework assignments, does more than all of the quizzes. This is easily the hardest one. This was given to us by the TA. And if you can solve it, then you got this. It's the one where we had to do a bunch of steps to solve it. The one was like 10 steps or something. 10 or 11. It was some ridiculous number. How's that? Here it is. Found it. Week 4, July 11, 2022 assignment. So that's the easy one for you to figure out. If, comma, if the general had been disloyal, he might have disobeyed orders, and if he had been distracted, he might have misunderstood them. If it, if it weren't the case that he was either disloyal or distracted, then we wouldn't have lost the battle. And if we hadn't lost the battle, that battle, we wouldn't have been 
losing the war. We wouldn't be losing the war. Now, if we weren't losing this war, the morale of the high command wouldn't have been so low. And it is definitely pretty low. Though, I forgot to put a space. If the general had disobeyed the orders, I would have heard rumors and I haven't. So the he so then he must have misunderstood them. You gotta translate these, okay? A would be actually no, she gave them to us in different letters. DL is equal to the general was Disloyal. The I is the general was distracted. D would be the the general disobeyed the orders. M would be the general misunderstood the orders. B would be, we lost the battle. W would be, we are losing the war. L would be, the morale of the high command is low. And R would be, I heard rumors. about the general disloyalty okay I apparently used a semicolon instead of an apostrophe my apologies everyone now that we have that we need to schematize this now this one has one of the most difficult schematizations I've ever seen that's why we're doing it obviously otherwise this would be a very pointless endeavor and the truth is that if you guys think you have a better way of doing because there's more than one way to do this, but I think this might be the correct way. This is the correct answer. I know that for a fact. However, I'm pretty sure there's a way to get to it with less steps. If you guys know it, please let me know. Otherwise, let us begin. P1 is if DL, then D. P2 is if DI, then M. P3 is is if not parentheses dl or di close parentheses comma then not b p4 will be if not b then not w hmm. p5 will be if not w then not l P6, L. P7, if D, then R. And P8, not R. Okay, that's given. This is given to us in the question. Now let's actually schematize this blasted thing. So first we need to understand what these are. These are all premises. Okay, we need to label them as such or else this doesn't count as a proof for some reason. Nice. And then it's period, semicolon to represent therefore the mathematical symbol, although it's off-centered by about a mm, few degrees instead of uh, 90, 45, 45. It should be a good old 60, 60, 60. 
but I digress. And the premise is we got M. He must have misunderstood them. That's where we got the final sentence. M is the general misunderstood the orders. Awesome. So step one. Not D. How can we be sure about that? Well, if we look at premise 7, premise 8, which are if D, then R, not R, then we know it's not D. And that is modus tollens. As far as I'm aware, that's correct. S2. Not DL. How do I know this? Because of S1. And P1. And this would be MT. I forgot to put these in parentheses. S3 would be if W, then B. Which is P4. And we're doing CP for that one. Don't worry, this one doesn't come with a jail sentence. So don't worry about that one. The next one will be S4, which is if L, then W. Same thing as before. It'll be S4 would be P5, comma, CP. Yes. Wait. Let me check again. Let me check my paper. If W, then B, P4. P5 is if L then W, this will be P5. And then if L then B would predicate on HS. HS was the hypothetical syllogism if A then B, if B then C. So in a sense, if L then B will be S3, S4, and HS. Okay, so let me explain that one because I just sort of checked it and I saw there was an error, but now I fixed the error. Thankfully, we hadn't gotten to the error yet. Otherwise, I would have been really sad. S4 is if L, then W. That's correct. So this is where I messed up, but I fixed it, so you're going to see the correct one only. If L, then B. And we get this with S3, S4, and HS. And matter of fact, you're not even going to learn what the error I made was because it's pointless to try to figure that out as it's not worth it. S6, B. How do I know? P6 and S5. P6 is L, which is a premise. If L then B, therefore B. And this is modus ponens. Good. We got, we got to know what everything is, okay? Because if you don't know what it is, then you're not going to finish. Then we have S7, which is if B. Will this paper please stay up? Please? Please stay up. Oh, to heck with this. Uh, you guys can't see this, but I'm looking at my assignment, and the paper keeps falling down. Which kind of sucks, but I'll fix it real quickly. Like that. Awesome. S7 is if B. There it is. Then, close paren open parentheses, DL or DI, which is just P3. And then it's the same thing, CP simple enough so far. Nothing too complicated. Now we can separate them. So S8 will be either DL or DI. And we get that through S6, comma, S7, comma, and that will be through modus ponens. And then we have S9, which will be DI, 
through S8 and S2. Like so. And that is the junctus syllogism. And finally, from there, we have S10, M, S9, as in D, I. And then finally, if D, I, then M, I believe. P1, if D, L, then D. Yeah. Oh, right. Oops. Yeah, DI, yes, which means M, because it's actually P2 and S2 and S9, my bad. Because if it's DI, then it's if DI, then M. DI is true, therefore M. And that will be modus ponens. Okay. <sighs> okay, that one took a really long time. But you know what? That is how you do it. I mean, you you gotta you gotta know how to do this. Otherwise, on the exam, it's gonna bite you in the behind, and no one wants that. Whew. Yikes, man! That, that was crazy. And that's how you do. That's how you use the famous forms to conclude. Well, to establish or derive the validity of a conclusion. Therefore, M was the conclusion. These are our translations. Bada bing, bada boom. Mr. Worldwide, while he steps in your room, this is what you have to do. Crazy, no? But it's fun. Formal fallacies we learned in this class. What are they? There are two formal fallacies. In a sense, if you see these two, or you come up with these two, you're wrong. P1 will be if A, then B. P2, not A, therefore. Not C. This has to do with the if Bacon wrote Stephen King's uh, if Bacon wrote Stephen King's It, then Bacon is a good writer. Bacon is a good writer, therefore Bacon wrote Stephen King's it, that doesn't work. That's denying the antecedent. Denying the antecedent. And the other one would be affirming the consequent, which is P1, if A then B, P2 says B, therefore A. That's also incorrect. If there is fire, then there is air in the room. There is air in the room, therefore there is fire. That is false. You can't do that. That's not a valid argument. We just possi we can possibility test this one in so many ways. It's just not even worth trying to prove that it's true. And that's it for week three, everybody. All we have left to do now is week four. And this might be either the longest or the second longest. I'll have to check back with chapter one again. Overall, we are making good progress. What are the different types of non-deductive or problemistic, probabilistic arguments we covered? And what is the basic form of each type? So, what are the different types of non-deductive or probabilistic probabilistic arguments we covered and what is the basic form of each type okay so what are these before I begin I might as well give you the main one the deductive form you know it's if a then b a therefore b that's therefore the step is s1 b but we all know about that one. Let's look at the other ones. The, the, the bone that we use the most is inference to best explanation. Which is P1 is evidence to be explained. P2 
would be additional information or evidence. And we have the main conclusion as derived from the passage itself. Explanation of evidence. And then C2 would be alternative explanation of evidence. In a sense, the whole, it is possible to postulate that X could also be the case. Uh, what do you think, everyone? Just by the mere presence of an alternative explanation, this kind of reasoning is possible for Miguel Martignon. Then we have causal explanations, which is P1 being correlation and the correlations can be perfect, strong, weak, none. Although if you have no correlation, then why are you doing this kind of argument? Between X and Y. And then of course, this correlation will then be separated into four different conclusions, which is C1 being X caused Y, C2 being Y caused X, C3 being uh, Z caused both X and Y, and C4 being uh, X and Y were, ca were caused coincidentally, meaning we have no idea. Or the better one, the one that I wrote down, was X and Y happened as a matter of coincidence. So inference, the best example. I mean, inference, yeah, to best explanation, my bad. Causal explanations and inductive arguments, which is P1. <sighs> Some X have property F. I apparently can't spell to save my life. P2, I mean, and conclusion would be all X have property F, or because inductive arguments actually have two different forms, P1 is two things, X and Y, are similar in that they share features A, B, C, uh, ellipses, uh, to some letter. Or as the textbooks write it, it's like that for some reason. And I know you're probably questioning, some of you are probably questioning, like, what textbook? You didn't have a textbook for this class. Well, actually, there were optional textbooks you can buy, but he did post the PDFs. X has feature F, therefore Y has feature F, although if you write property, they're also correct. Like that, both of those would be correct, albeit neither is more correct than the other. After all, this is an animal farm. Then we have analogy, which is a P1 being X and Y are analogous. P2 being that X has property F. Therefore, C1, Y has property F. Seems very similar in that, but when they're analogous, it's a bit different. It means that you can use them as an analogy. This is the watch and universe riddle. What is the difference between premises that count as evidence and premises that count as information? Well, this one's easy. Uh, evidence, okay, so we want it Explained means evidence, and the other one will be 
we don't need it explained. Uh, we don't want explanation. I O N means information. Simple, right? Good. <sighs> okay, simple enough. What are the criteria for determining the best explanation? Well, before we get the criteria, I should at least give you the steps for evaluating said information. Well, I give you the steps to determine it, then we evaluate. So step one, actually let's erase this section really quickly. What are the criteria for determining the best explanation? Well, step one would be schematize the argument like always. Step two would be identify which premises are pieces of evidence and which pieces are information. Okay, step three, we need to lay out all the serious possible explanations. Step four will be evaluate each explanation's explanatory power, uh, conformance to back ground knowledge, simplicity, and these ones are a bit open-ended, so I'm pretty sure he's just going to have us do multiple choices of these ones. Simplicity, and testability slash predictive power. All right. And then step five, determine a clear winner. The issue with step five is that we will not always have a clear winner. Don't you know? Because the issue with that is that words and phrases are quite subjective. Therefore, it's possible that we are, in a, in a sense, how should I say, forced to realize that a lot of the times, given that these explanations are hinged on information we have at the moment, and due to the fact that a lot of these arguments w could be changed simply by the knowledge of new information, it's possible to have answers that tie, it's possible to have no clear winner at all, it's possible to have a overwhelmingly clear winner, but then suddenly new information is given, therefore that completely clear winner could be wrong. And that's the huge issue with it. Uh, so, first, we need to, we already know what those are. But at the end of the day, those are the steps. And the criteria are explanatory power, conformance to background knowledge, simplicity, and testability slash predictive power. Those are your steps. Next, we need to answer this question. What are basic types of causal argument conclusions? There are four, and I already wrote these down, so I'll, write, so I'll just copy and paste these. X cause Y, Y cause X, X, Z cause both X and Y, and X and Y happen as a matter of coincidence. In what way do we evaluate inductive arguments? Well, let's see. Step one. Well, first, 
to determine an inductive argument, right, we need to know what this form of argument is. In a sense, an inductive argument is a form of generalization. And now that we know that, we can begin with step one. Identify what the sample is. The sample is the could be something along the lines of ravens that I have seen. Or it could be a spoon of soup that I tried. And then we have to identify the general population that the sample is supposed to represent. In the first one, you can easily make the claim. You can make the claim that it is all ravens. Or it could be all ravens in Area X or all ravens, so on and so forth. And the other one is the soup is a bit popped. Okay, and the soup is your huge population. How much soup you have? You got one of those, you know, you got one of those. Have you ever been to like a Mexican party? They have the olla and it's full of pozole or something. That's what I'm thinking about. It's a huge pot. Whereas you're trying to spoon full of soup. Step three would be identify the relevant, well, property that the sample has. Now, what is this relevant property? Well, the ravens have the property of being black, and the spoonful has the property of being salty. If my spoonful of soup is salty, then it's possible that the relevant population, well, the general population being the big pot of soup, is salty as well. Or I just happen to get an area that just had a higher concentration of salt than the other areas. Maybe it wasn't mixed too well. Whatever the reason, that is your example. Then we ask ourselves, why do we have the relevant property? In particular, we ask, is there a plausible explanation besides the explanation that the general population also has the property? All the raven in the tower are black, but not everywhere. The soup has a lot of potatoes, but they sink to the bottom. Therefore, the spoonful was salty rather than savory, or something along those lines, okay? Now that we have that one, let's see this one. Let's look at an induction argument, shall we? Whoo, this is going to be good. Copy the induction argument. In the 1930s, don't worry, I won't use my Great Depression voice, the Literary Digest pulled over two million people asking whether they were going to vote for Landon or Roosevelt. The people were contacted by randomly selecting numbers from phone books across the country. They found that the good majority of people polled said they were voting for the Republican candidate. So, the polling agency concluded that Landon was going to win. That's a good induction argument, in a sense, your little generalization. Let's evaluate the premise, eh? The premise is that a good majority of people polled said they were voting Republican, well, voting for the Republican candidate. And then from here we have our conclusion, because it's actually not a very complicated premise. The conclusion is a good majority of the nation is planning on voting for the Republican candidate. Fine. So what is the sample? We need to identify the sample to keep going. Because we already schematized it. Well, you see, the sample here is random people being pulled from the phone book. What is this a representative sample of? And you see, the rele it is a relevant sample of those who are going to vote in the upcoming election for the President of the United States. And then, of course, we've got relevant property. Random people voted, polled from the phone book as... Okay, random people from the phone book have 
I can't spell apparently, the property of being largely in favor of Landon. Okay? And then finally, why does this sample have said property? Well, you see, people in phone books are wealthier and well fear people prefer Landon. So now we can come up with another conclusion that does not violate P1 but still explains everything. And that next conclusion is why did I write P2? My bad. C1. Why did I write P2? That's a good question. People in phone books are wealthier and wealthier people prefer Landon. I'm apparently channeling my inner, I don't know, something. Because I have a weird voice this time around. So now we need to evaluate it, okay? Evaluation. C1. First, explanatory power. And the answer is, this is likely. If a good majority of the nation is voting for the Republican candidate simply because people polled said so. That's a fairly good generalization, as in, I went to this restaurant, I ordered a good food, therefore the food is good. That's a decent generalization. It could just be that that one order was good or the person who prepared it was good and everyone else sucks, but you never know. Maybe the whole thing is good. It's a generalization. I'll probably take you up on your offer. Then we have background knowledge. People said that they would vote for Landon in P1. In the actual, in the actual statement, people said they'd vote for Landon. I had a friend in high school called Landon. He was a decent person. Then we have simple. This is pretty simple, actually. You say to yourself, okay, let's ask this random sample from the phone book, which technically is not really random as it pretty much falls into people who are also in the phone book, but so what? Sad sample being, well, not even sample, just the, is this a simple thing? Yes, okay. You ask people, hey, who are you voting for? More people say the Republican. You're probably thinking, okay, more people are going to vote for the Republican. And then finally, pretty simple. And then finally, testable predictions. And the answer is they exist. And you can tell they exist because that's how they got the example in the first place. They polled people. And in the poll, they got that people wanted to vote for Landon, the Republican candidate, as opposed to Roosevelt. And now let's do C2. Explanatory power is likely. Okay. Then we have background knowledge. The answer is somewhat likely, and the reason we know this is because while technically speaking none of what we just said was in the text itself, we used evidence that we knew from the time being our personal evidence because you're supposed to, you could use evidence from the text, but we're also using our own evidence just because we've lived long enough to see it. This is from back then, this was back when Roosevelt was uh, on the ballot. I don't think Roosevelt's on the ballot today or in the future, but you get the point. Specifically, you know, this Roosevelt. FDR. And then for simple, it's a bit more complicated, given that you have to assume some things about people on phone books. They need to have more money or something. You need to assume that people polled in phone books probably are wealthier and wealthier people like tax breaks but then again so do a lot of people and at the time the Republican was a party of you know lower taxes you could argue it's still is today but I'm not going to do that because that's not my job my job is to help you guys do this testable predictions 
Well, we just kind of went over a lot of testable predictions in our head. That's how we got the simple and the explanatory power, so they exist. Here's the problem with this, however. How could we tell if we have a winner? Oh boy, that's going to be a hard one. Well, the answer, realistically, is this is not a causal argument. This is an inductive argument. Therefore, both can be seen as true. They both explain it, and we just evaluated it. They're both pretty likely. It's possible that, you know... But however, if you know the history, you know that FDR won the presidency, if I remember correctly. Let me, let me check it out. I believe so. Uh, who won between Roosevelt and Landon? The popular vote of the Great Depression, President FDR defeated Republican Alf Landon of Kansas. Roosevelt won the highest share in the popular electoral vote. So in a sense, the second argument is correct because we know for a fact that, using background knowledge, during the Great Depression, people wanted Democrats in office. Fine. Although, if you really think about it, this is not a correct argument, and this is actually a more correct argument well, this is actually is a correct argument, and this is a false argument because more people were actually voting Democrat at the time. But that's only possible because we know background knowledge. However, background knowledge for the first evaluation, C1, we use based off the text, whereas evaluation for C2, we use based off historical facts that we just so happen to know. By the way, this was the election in 1936. So you always learn something with me. Now, how do we evaluate analogical arguments? Because that's also a good question we have. How do we evaluate analogical arguments? Let's see. You know what? I'm just gonna copy and paste this one because typing this one out loud is a bit annoying. First, analogy schematization, okay? This involves an analogy between two things, X and Y, in one premise, and another premise that claims X and Y have property F. Therefore, we conclude that Y or X has property F. Simple enough. So let's schematize. That would be X and Y are analogous, which is P1. P2 will be that X has property F, and then C1 would be that Y has property F. That's how you would schematize an analogy. Now we need to test for goodness, okay? And to test for goodness of an analogous argument, we have four criteria. Criteria one, is P1 true? Are X and Y similar in the way the author claims? For this instance, we're just gonna assume that yes, because I don't wanna immediately start doubting my professor at the current moment. Mostly because we're about to take a test and I wanna be on his good side. Two. Uh, are the similarities between X and Y similar in the way that the... Oh, shoot. Are the similarities between X and Y relevant? That's a good question. Are they? They better be. Is P2 true? Let me fix this T really quickly. Is P2 true? Does X really have feature F? And P4 is... Uh, are there any relevant dissimilarities between X and Y? If all four of these criteria tend to check for goodness as positive, 
then this is how you'll schematize an argument, and here's how you'll test for the analogous argument to make sure it works. Otherwise, we're flawed. Good. We have finished this super long review. The sections of the final will include 5 true-false questions, 20 multiple-choice questions, 2 deductions, schematizing using variables and applying the famous form questions, and 3 non-deductive arguments being inference to the best explanation. Let it be known that IBE is both a cause and a conclusion. Let it be known that conclusions are a causal story of how evidence came about, inductive arguments, and analogical arguments. Very well, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you the best of luck in passing your exams. And here's my blue statement. Uh, blue. Uh, if you prepare correctly, and don't if you prepare correctly while not psyching yourself out then you will pass and then finally for my red I'll say I believe in you